Hello students, this is Professor Gordon. This is part three of um, the European Settlement North America recorded lecture. And this uh, particular topic is a very important topic. It's going to be a little bit longer than the previous one about the French and the Dutch and the Iroquois. Uh, this one's actually about English colonization uh, in Jamestown, uh, as well as throughout the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, also, is going to cover um, the first and second Powhatan Wars, uh, the growth of indentured servanthood, the introduction of slavery, and Bacon's Rebellion. And then in the last part, we'll talk about the Pilgrims and the Puritans coming uh, to New England. So let's look at what actually a joint stock company was, because that's the reason why the English settle in uh, Virginia. So a joint stock company is kind of like a, a 1600s version of a corporation where you have a group of investors and uh, they each put in some money into a business adventure and or a business venture, I should say, not adventure. And the risk is shared. So that means if, you know, I put in 10,000, somebody else puts in 10,000, another person put in 10,000, I don't put all the money that I have, um, then, there, then um, I'm not going to lose everything if, if the company goes under and the risk is shared among investors. And so um, that's kind of how investing and stuff works today. So the, what ends up settling um, the Chesapeake is not the government, not the British government, but it's actually uh, joint stock companies. Where the French, you, you have a joint stock company that come in, but really it's the government that's driving a lot of that. The Dutch, it is the, the Dutch West India Company. Uh, Spain is the government, uh, but England, it's, it's joint stock companies. Okay, So the first attempt was actually by Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Um, his uh, ship most likely um, sunk somewhere off the coast of Rhode Island, I think, probably from, from a storm. Uh, it failed in the 1500s. You also have Sir Fernando uh, George's uh, attempt as well. And um, that uh, end up falling and so forth. And uh, Fernando, uh, Fernando George's colony uh, was along the coast of Maine um, and it, it failed because of a harsh climate. Sir Walter Raleigh founded uh, probably the most famous colony, didn't make it, the lost colony at Roanoke in North Carolina um, because it was established and appeared to be thriving. And then uh, they left it and came back about three years later and the uh, settlement had been abandoned and they found the word Croatan on the tree. So that's what's the nearby Native American tribe. So we don't know if they killed by them, um, died from disease, um, or they assimilated um, after they were struggling with starvation with the Croatan people. We'll never know. If you ever figure that out, you should publish a book because you can make a lot of money if you can prove it, your theory correct. Okay. So the first permanent English settlement is in 1607 at Jamestown, uh, right there on the, on the uh, James River. And James I was uh, king at the time. He granted a land grant to Virginia Company of London, which was supposed to be from New York uh, to North Carolina uh, to New York uh, State. It's a big, huge land grant. Uh, technically, they didn't consult any Native Americans, but they claimed it uh, and rival to European powers. Um, it's credit to make a, a profit quickly. And um, it's, it's, it's really incredible that the, the colony actually survives and later thrives because it should have died out very quickly. So it was founded in 1607 at the mouth of James River, hence Jamestown, thanks to the King James. And they call it the James River, thanks to the King as well. Okay. So what's crazy is they went to a new land with not a single farmer. I thought that's one of the dumbest things in world history is they came without a single farmer. Um, they had what you, a lot of people that came were, um, they had miners, um, they had silkworm growers. Yes, I can't make that up. Um, they had jewelers who were supposed to kind of be able to figure out where, um, um, precious minerals were, but they had several um, sons of wealthy individuals who were not the firstborn who was going to inherit dad's wealth. Um, they came to try to strike it rich quick and make a name for themselves. Not a single farmer, as you can see how that's going to go. And 105 came. After the first winter, they're down to 35 to 38 individuals. We don't know the exact number, but that's estimated um, because they didn't, have way to f they didn't really know how to farm and feed themselves. In fact, if it wasn't for the Native American help from the nearby Powhatan Confederation, uh, that would have been done and Jamestown would have been failed, uh, much like um, the lost colony at Roanoke, except we probably know the reason why. Okay, so 1609, what saved the colony is just 400 more settlers came. Okay, so this is where Jamestown was. You can see where the lost colony of Roanoke was down here. This is near the, the mouth of James River. The problem is it's kind of swampy in that area and the water's bad. So you get a lot of people that end up getting dysentery, which is... If you ever wonder what dysentery is, it's where the bottom falls out of your world and the world falls out of your bottom. Okay, it's basically like you can't hold any, any kind of nutrients down in your stomach. 
So this is what the early Jamestown colony looked like. Notice they have like a fort set up for defense. Okay. And um, they suffered from malaria thanks to the terrible river uh, nearby uh, for getting fresh water. And it's not like they had any, any idea about water treatment back then. Um, they lacked food. Um, and they, they definitely had some conflict uh, with the nearby Pamaki Indians. Um, and to the point where they were basically prisoners in their own fort. And so between 1609 to 1610, about 90% death rate, they call it the starving time. <coughs> There's evidence of individuals uh, eating leather um, and cases of cannibalism. One guy gets either hung or shot for eating um, his dead pregnant wife, if that tells you anything. It's terrible. Um, eventually what ends up happening is first Lord Delaware, which is uh, kind of where we get the term Delaware from. His real name is Thomas West. Became a governor who inflicted a strict military order. He's like, if you don't work, you don't eat. And then later, John Smith, um, his leadership saved the colony from failure as well. And uh, which is a fascinating story because Disney has the first Pocahontas movie. Um, they portray John Smith as having a romantic relationship with Pocahontas. That's actually not true. What historians think happened is John Rolfe, um, who in the second Pocahontas movie, she supposedly married, you can tell I've young kids. Um, John Smith uh, was jealous of them getting invited to all the nice parties in England because uh, John Rolfe brought back Pocahontas, who he's the first guy to introduce tobacco into uh, Virginia, which allowed it to be successful. John Smith made up a story about Pocahontas saving his life when he was get, almost about to be killed by her or her father, Powhatan, to, to get himself invited to these uh, 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 English parties. So it was he was a fictitious guy. Uh, well, he's not he's a real person in history, but he made up a story to try to become famous because he was jealous of John Roth and Pocahontas uh, and so forth. And so, um, no bueno. And um, so over the first five years, the, mortal the mortality rate was about 80%. My word. Uh, Powhatan was a strong, powerfully built man who had, who had between 8,000 to 10,000 Indian soldiers uh, under his command. And uh, basically, you didn't jack with this guy. Now, later when he dies, the English are going to fight against his brother, who succeeded him in power. Okay, that's not really unclear in history. If it was a long-term confederation or it was a recent confederation, we just, we just don't have a historical record in that one way or the other. Powhatan had been trained with the Europeans for a time before Jamestown, so it's interesting. We we don't have a whole lot of historical record of this, but the Europeans, various European countries, had trade along the coast. Uh, the, the Native Americans wanted uh, metal tools, clothing, shoes, uh, later firearms, and so forth, and uh, they were able to uh, trade for that, and the Europeans would, would get furs and um, uh, fish and, and other things. Um, they also would, Native Americans wanted hooks and blankets, so the hooks that they used for fishing. They did have copper for wealth and prestige goods, which the English uh, could give those more for, uh, for other things. The Indians thought that the English had impressive things to trade, but were unimpressive in trying to survive. Can you blame them? Uh, English thought that they could embrace their way of life, but to the English, they didn't possess a true government, economy, or religion. And so there's a big cultural difference there. Uh, Indians practice intercropping, which is where you burn away underbrush and plant crops in a clear area. Uh, it's kind of devastating to the environment, really. But the English practice monocropping, which is what we typically view as farming. Um, and, and really, Powhatan wanted the, the English to understand, look, I hold the power, not you. And, um, and, and he, he just didn't really understand, like, why the English would raid their villages to steal food. It's like, you should be self-sufficient. And, and so when they would raid his villages, then he would retaliate and beat the side of the English. Um, the Indians were thinking mutual respect, while the English were thinking of what they could get out of it. Um, and so it, it was different. As the English don't really send missionaries either to Jamestown. He might have uh, recommended a, a nicer policy. Now, one of the things that, uh, that saves Jamestown well, really, what the thing that does save Jamestown is the introduction of tobacco. Um, the English smuggle some type of, uh, of a tobacco seed out of uh, present-day Cuba, which, by the way, the Cuban soil is, is one of the greatest areas for growing to tobacco because of it's kind of a perfect climate for it. Um, but the crop does very well, and smoking tobacco becomes all the rage in Europe. What's ironic is that uh, King James the first um, had smoked a an earlier cigarette and said, hmm, I think this is bad for your lungs and your health. Well, you know, they thought he was ridiculous. Uh, James predicted what the uh, Surgeon General warning came out in the 1960s, that smoking is bad for you and bad for your lungs. 
But um, tobacco is a very labor intensive uh, crop. Now, is this labor intensive as sugar? No. But it does, um, at times of the year, require lots and lots of work. And so they need um, these landowners who come over and establish land uh, because eventually the Virginia Company of London kind of goes under and the English government has to take it over. And so what they do is they, in order to get them um, to uh, bring over settlers, they will offer what's called the headright system for every 50 acres of land that, that the government gave you. You, um, if you brought over an indentured servant, you got 50 more acres of land. And so what would happen is you'd have merchants that would find not the poorest farmers uh, and not landowning farmers, but like tenant farmers. Okay, they, were, they weren't recruiting homeless people. They were t recruiting tenant farmers, particularly young uh, single tenant farmers and would say, hey, we'll pay for your passage if you agree to work for four to seven years, depending on what labor contract they worked out. And they would come over and they would work for the landowner. But um, um, the reason why they do this is really it's the English dream at the time, chance to own your own land, because once the indentured servant would serve their time, then they could go out on the frontier and acquire land for themselves. Now they would take it from the Native Americans, but they could get it uh, and if they get killed or die from disease. But so many did die from disease and so forth. So it is tobacco that led to Virginia planter's success. Highlight that, star it, know it. You most likely see on a quiz and you certainly see on your test. Okay. It's introduced by John Rolfe and uh, got to know what indentured servanthood is. This is the earliest labor system. Um, and later it's going to be replaced by um, slavery, but won't, that won't happen really until after Bacon's rebellion. So the head rights system, you want to star that or underline it's 50 acres for every seller you brought over as indentured servanthood. So you got to pay for that. Okay. They did have problems with Indians um, in 1622. They had a uh, conflict with Powhatan's brother and that led to an uprising that one fourth of the settlers, of, um, which was about 350, uh, were killed, including John Rolfe and Pocahontas. That's tragic. You don't see that for any reason. Uh, the, the English thereafter sought to wipe out the Indian presence along the frontier. Some 14,000 men, women and children had migrated to Jamestown since 1607. but Most of them had died. The population in 1624 stood at about 1100. So out of 14,000, 1,100 are still there. Um, in 1624, Virginia became a royal colony. Colonists still flocked to Virginia as well as other colonies. And in 1644, the second Anglo-Powhatan War was waged with the Indians trying to dislodge the English one last time, but failed. The Peace Treaty of 1646 repudiated any hope of assimilating Native peoples into Virginia society or of peacefully coexisting with them. Instead, it effectively banished the Chesapeake Indians from their ancestral lands and formally separated Indian from white areas of settlement. Um, and see, you see how this is going to play out in, in U.S. history big time. Conflict, English moving on to uh, Native Americans' lands, and then there's conflict and war. By 1650, there were about 15,000 white residents of Virginia. Many former servants became planters in their own right, and women typically improved their status through marriage. And by 1676, one-fourth of the free white men in Virginia were landless. So I want to go over a couple things here. There are some, going to be some commonalities between them and the uh, New England colonies. Okay. Um, there are, um, are, well, I guess I'll go over some differences. First is Virginia, uh, the Chesapeake region, is going to have similar conflict with Native Americans dealing with encroachment on lands as New England colonies. Um, one difference between the New England colonies, they're going to bring large families. The people coming primarily in the Chesapeake region are single men. Okay, not always, but single men. Because women were such uh, few, they actually had a higher status than they did in Puritan New England um, because a woman who was poor, who didn't born any wealth, could marry somebody who was a wealthy landowner and, and elevate her status overnight by getting married. Um, also, the Chesapeake colonies had a cash crop agriculture with tobacco, while New England had a much more variety of economy with shipbuilding and uh, farming and hip ma rope making and molasses business and, and uh, fishing and stuff like that. So that, that's some differences there. Um, the death rate is much higher in, in the Chesapeake, Virginia, and Maryland than it is in New England uh, because of the climate. Okay. So tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. You got to know it. One of the reasons why you need more land is it depletes its, the soil nutrients very rapidly. And so you're going to have to move further west to get more land and let fields lay fallow, which means you don't plant anything on it for a couple of years to let it regain its nutrients. Okay. And it became very popular, not as popular as sugar, but still, still very profitable. 
So the first slaves were brought over by the Dutch in 1619, but they're too expensive to, to, to do them. So it is indentured servanthood is the labor for early part of Jamestown, where New England, you don't have, you have some indentured servanthood, but not as much as mostly families because they're coming for religious reasons. Okay. So Virginia House of Burgess also was established in 1619. It's the first time um, that you have representative government in the um, what becomes the United States. So it's the first time you have representative government in the England col English colonies. Let me repeat that one last time. It is the first time you have representative government in the English colonies. Okay, very, very important. Got to know that. Now, um, the southern colonies are this region. But I want to distinguish something, okay? So when I'm talking about the Chesapeake, this is the Chesapeake Bay right here. I'm talking about Maryland, Virginia, okay? Maryland, Virginia. Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York are all in the new, uh, middle colonies. They're going to have a diverse population, diverse economy. North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Long Virginia, Maryland, Arkansas, are the South, but Virginia, Maryland are kind of a sub-region, and that's the Chesapeake. This area takes off um, first, and then, then it's South Carolina, then North Carolina, then Georgia. Georgia is actually kind of the, the youngest colony before the American Revolution. Okay, so Chesapeake is Virginia and Maryland, Virginia and Maryland, but it's still part of the southern colonies because they had slavery and cash crop farming. Okay, if you look right here at the type of soil, you can see why this is some of the great farming regions of the English colonies and up here, not so much. Okay, so um, you can see also the population in thousands. Um, you also see slavery taking off. Oh, Bacon's Rebellion happens in 1676. And then, boom, they eventually abandon the indentured servanthood and start going into importing slaves. And a lot of the slaves are brought over in, in fact, the vast majority of slaves that are brought over from Africa are brought over in the 1700s. <clears throat> you can see the Native American population declining as well. Now, how does Maryland found it? It's actually founded for religious reasons. It was founded as a safe haven for um, Catholics. Um, now, in France, Catholicism won out, but in England, Protestantism wins out. Um, you do have some times you have some Catholic monarchs such as um, Queen Mary of Scots and, and, uh, and some others. But um, Lord Baltimore was a wealthy nobleman, and he wanted uh, his Catholic uh, adherents protected. And so... In 1634 is when Lord Baltimore founded, his name was Cecil Calvert, when King Charles I, who was a friend of his, granted him a land grant. So it became the first proprietary colony. And that was where a colony is owned by an individual, not by, not by a joint stock company. So a proprietary colony owned by an individual, not a joint stock company. Sir George, Sir, Sir George Calvert, the first Lord Baltimore, had announced in 1625 his conversion to Catholicism and sought the colony as a refuge for English Catholics who were subjugated to discrimination at home. Okay. So it's a refuge for Catholics. They, uh, like Virginia, prospered from uh, tobacco. And um, so it was started for profits as well. Don't just think it was just a religious colony solely, but it was uh, uh, a um, for profits. In fact, uh, uh, my, on my dad's side, my ancestors came over in 1697 to Maryland, uh, we, uh, we think, to work as indentured servants uh, for a Catholic landowner and so forth. Um, so indentured, uh, white indentured servants provided much of the labor for the land barons. Maryland's population grew quickly because the Calverts imported scores of artisans and offered ample grants of land to wealthy migrants. So they gave business uh, incentives. Governor Calvert allowed a representative assembly after he violated the charter who insisted on the right to initiate legislation. So similar to the Virginia House of Burgesses, representative assembly, but you had to own property in order to be able to vote. Once many, many Protestants arrived there, they passed the Act of Toleration in 1649. Okay, you definitely need to know that. So underline it, star it, know it. Um, it granted uh, religious toleration to Christian groups, both Jew, I mean, uh, both uh, Catholics and Protestants. Now, doesn't provide religious toleration for, for Jews, because there weren't really any Jews that were migrating at this time, or, 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 or Muslims and so forth. That comes later in American history, but at this time it provided religious toleration but for Catholics and Protestants, <clears throat> and, um, and so forth. So that's where Maryland was founded, right there along Chesapeake Bay. I've been to Maryland, I've been to Baltimore, actually. In fact, our famous United States Naval Academy is in Annapolis, and... Uh, Best seafood I've ever had in my life was at Baltimore. All right. So keep in mind, life in the Chesapeake was very harsh. 
Um, scarcity of towns deprives settlers of community. Unlike we're in New England and uh, um, you had tremendous towns of community and so forth. That was one of the really cool things of Puritan and Pilgrim New England. Um, families were equally scarce because there were few women settlers and marriages often ended with the death of a young spouse. Uh, because women were so few, they actually had higher status in the Chesapeake than in New England. That's a key difference between the two. Pregnant women were vulnerable to malaria. Many mothers died after burying a, a first or second child, so, the, uh, so that orphaned children and unmarried men formed a larger segment of society. Although 15,000 English migrants arrived in Virginia between 1622 and 1640, the population during that period rose from about 2,000 to 8,000. Very sucks. The average lifespan was about 19 or 20, so I'd have been dead long ago. Okay. So um, let me talk about what indentured servanthood is one more time. Okay. So you basically were enter a, a labor contract that you're going to agree to work. So it's not slavery. Uh, it seems like it is, but it basically is um, you're entering into a labor contract. I'm going to work for you for four to seven years. Okay? Now you can imprison me if I don't serve my, my uh, contract time and so forth. But, um, and once I finish my term of service, I can go out on the frontier and acquire land. Um, a lot of poor single white tenant farmers do it. So those that didn't own their own land back in England. And what's cool is they have a chance that they have nowhere else in Europe, chance to own their own land. That's why so many are willing to risk their lives and even have 80% death rates at times to do this. Um, so only about 25% were able to gain respectability and prosper. You're like, well, then why would anybody do this? Well, because that 25% chance was still greater than any chance you had back in England or anywhere, any other country in Europe. And that chance had a better life is what drove them to do it. Okay. Now you're also going to have the importation of African laborers. So by 1649, um, you're looking at, um, you know, basically uh, just a few years uh, after the uh, first bring, uh, Dutch bringing um, slaves in 1619 to the port of Jamestown. There's only 400 Africans in all of the English colonies. It was, it was crazy how few there were. Uh, by 1670, just a few years, uh, about 20 years later, only 5% of the population was black. Um, a lot of them worked and obtained freedom until 1660 when the Virginia House of Burgesses uh, passed a decree that um, they began um, 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 where they, they passed where um, blacks could not marry whites and so forth. So they actually created racial laws. And it's really a tragic thing. But uh, in fact, there were some um Blacks that were able to obtain their freedom and actually bought slaves for themselves before this law was passed in 1660. And um, uh, so some did actually marry English women before that racial law was passed. But once the tobacco boom ended in 1660, things changed. Plants, planters needed to make it as cheap as possible once the price of tobacco sold for a tenth of its original value. Ooh, that was a price that plummeted. As English-born elite imported fewer English servants and more African slaves, Chesapeake, Legislatures grew more conscientious of race and enacted laws undercutting the status of blacks. By 1671, the Virginia House of Burgess had forbidden Africans to own guns or join the militia. It also barred them from uh, buying labor contracts of white servants and from winning their freedom by converting to Christianity. Wow. Okay. Very, very much a racist um, legal laws that, that, that took place there. I think is the reason why I say race is actually defined by race. Okay, let's talk about the Navigation Acts. Okay. Um, and then we'll get to Bacon's Rebellion and then we'll stop there and we'll eventually get to the Puritans and the Pilgrims. Um, and so the Navigation Acts were designed to make it where um, the English colonies only traded with England. Okay. The Dutch were able to undercut the British and shipping costs. Okay. So let's picture this. Let's say the Dutch are UPS and the British shipping is FedEx. All right. I'm not trying to play any favorites here, but, um, but let's say that UPS is cheaper than FedEx. And so the English are like, well, don't ship it on FedEx or UPS. You're going to ship on FedEx uh, because you're English colonists. You should only ship on English ships. And so they made it where you're only supposed to trade with um, England. Now, the Navigation Acts made it where if you want to trade with, say, Portugal, you would have to ship your goods on an English ship all the way to England, pay a tax uh, to a British merchant and ship it down to Portugal on an English ship uh, before you could sell it to them. Well, what ends up happening is... American merchants are like, yeah, screw that. And they don't abide by it. They also just bribe the customs official. And because England is preoccupied with other problems of Europe at this time and what's happening in the Indian Ocean trade, 
and they're also starting to get involved in the African slave trade um, in the Atlantic Ocean, they're like, they don't enforce it. And so the Navigation Acts before the Seven Years' War or the French Indian War does not get enforced. That is a significant thing because after the Seven Years' War, the Navigation Acts begin to be enforced, and that's one of the causes of the American Revolution that we'll cover in Module 2. Okay. So, um, so, but tobacco exports from the Chesapeake, which is Virginia, Maryland, doubled between 1670 and 1700, even the price of it dropped. Um, but just like um, um, Europe, you're going to have elite dominate the area politically. But here's the deal. If you could own your own land, you could vote. You could actually serve in Virginia House of Legis uh, uh, Burgesses. You did not have that ability in England. Okay, So that, that kind of goes back to early American democracy. Now, let's get to Bacon's Rebellion, uh, because this one is a turning point uh, in early American colonial history. Um, it, it's, it's not a tremendous short-term effect, but what the, the long-term effect is, is eventually landowners are going to stop by, uh, bringing over indentured servants and start buying um, slaves that can, they can keep for a much longer time. So let's see, who was Nathaniel Bacon? Um, he was actually a former indentured servant. He had... Uh, worked his time of service and went out on the frontier and obtained his own land. And what ends up happening is a lot of where the former Duchess servants settled, so they were poor, was on the frontier. Well, the frontier was frequently attacked by Native Americans. I wonder why, because they were encroaching on their lands. Okay. Well, they wanted government protection from the Virginia House of Burgesses under Governor Berkeley back in Jamestown. And so the government's like, oh, you poor former Duchess servants, you can have your own stuff. Well, Nathaniel Bacon um, runs for the Virginia House of Burgesses and he wins. And then he gets into the Virginia House of Burgesses and throws a big fit about how they're treating the, the former indentured servants on the frontier and they eventually kick him out. And he's like, oh, no, you didn't. So then he raises up former indentured servants to rise up. They go into Jamestown. They burn it to the ground. Governor Bertha has to flee. What eventually happens is the wealthy uh, landowners along the coast, they're able to purchase kind of a militia. Uh, Nathaniel Bacon ends up getting sick and dies. And typically when you have a rebellion and the leader dies, the rebellion dies with them. And that's actually what happens with Bacon's rebellion. Okay. Um, and so um, it, it's kind of like a mini civil war within colonial Virginia and some rebels are hung after uh, Bacon, Nathaniel Bacon dies. And so here is the result, okay? the effect of it. You want to highlight this, star it, know it, underline it, whatever you need to do. But the, the significance of Bacon's Rebellion is that it leads to wealthy landowners, instead of paying for indentured service to come over, they started importing African slaves. And so even though that happens in 1676, most of the slaves are imported primarily 1690s and after. But it's a slow process, but more and more landowners are going to buy and buy and buy and buy slaves. And Britain takes over the slave trade in the 1700s, and that's when the vast majority of slaves are brought over in American history are brought over in the 1700s. Okay. Um, it's not really the 1600s where the majority are brought over. In fact, very few are brought over in the 1600s. It's the 1700s. That's the century. And that's happened to be the century where the, the British dominated. Okay. And you can see right here uh, as a result of that. So by 1700, only 11% of the population is African. By 1755, it's 20%. Okay. Look at also the diversity of, of uh, Scotch, Irish, and German coming over. And you can see, look at listen, look at this impact long term in American history. This is slavery in the 1830, 1860. Okay, major conflict in American history as a result of uh, the decision to begin importing much more African slaves, and it's going to forever change the course of American history. Okay, so the primary cause of rebellion was poverty and anger that they're not getting helped out um, and so forth. And so uh, the, the indentured servants just wanted to wipe out the Indians and be done with them, where uh, the Virginia House of Purchase didn't want to do that, and uh, that led to Bacon's Rebellion. All right, last part is the Puritan uh, pure, uh, pure, Pilgrim New England, and we'll get to that in the last part.